You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Have you ever read a Moon Knight comic? Not a lot of people have. It's okay if you haven't. <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to Systematic Geekology. We are the Priest of the Geeks. This is a bonus episode where we're going to be reviewing Moon Knight by Brian Bendis and Alex Maliv. We're going to talk a little bit also of uh, the Moon Knight. Um, who, who's the other one that we've read recently? Charlie Houston. Charlie, yeah, Charlie Finch. Houston. And I know David Finch did the art on the other one that we're going to mention. Mm-hmm. They're mostly talking about the one by Brian Bendis. Um, if you don't know who Moon Knight is, this is great. We did a previous episode about superheroes with mental health disorders where we talked a lot about the character of Moon Knight. This episode's coming out the day of the premiere of the Moon Knight series on Disney+. Plus. So here we're just kind of doing a deep dive into a specific comic that we wanted to take time to read preparing for this show. I am Joshua Knoll. I am a fourth year biblical studies student at North Greenville University. And I, I've done a lot of geeky stuff lately. Um, primarily, I have started reading a lot of Moon Knight comics, like too much. I'm getting on people's nerves. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Only talking about Moon Knight. <laughs> well, happy Moon Knight Day, Joshua. Happy Thank Moon you. Knight Day. Today, this is coming out on, as you said, when this this very hype Disney Plus TV show, they've done great things with their uh, Marvel character, characters through Disney Plus, and we get another one with Moon Knight, and you know, we'll see what they do with this one. How's it going? I am Chill Will from Chapel Thrill. And uh, I'm geeking out because I'm on the doorstep of the University of North Carolina. My church is here in Chapel Hill, and I have a team that's going to the Final Four. So I'm geeking out hard on March Madness basketball. And, uh, yeah, I don't know when you're listening to this, but, uh, man, they're going to meet Duke in the Final Four. And I'm very nervous and stressed out and very happy and excited and geeking out hard on oh, yeah. that. This that's is the where first I time those two in-state rivals have met in the Final Four, isn't it? It is. And yeah. me here sitting in Chapel Hill right now, Durham's like in Duke, eight miles down the road. So it's crazy <laughs> that those two teams have to travel all the way to New Orleans uh, to battle against another. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Coach K's revenge or vengeance game uh, to try to beat the Tar Heels for them beating him in his last game in their home turf. And so we'll see how it how it uh, pans out. And I'm excited because Joshua, uh, many years ago, I started a God Loves Geeks book club in my church in South Carolina. And we would do this thing where we'd pick a reading or a graphic novel or a sci-fi book and we'd come together, we'd read it and then we'd come back together and talk about it. And I and I feel like that's what we're doing right now. We're going to hop into a God Loves Geeks episode throwback where we read a graphic novel and now we're going to talk about the graphic novel and the author and the art and then whatever theological, philosophical themes arise out of it so so we're 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 doing a god loves geeks uh meeting right now i'm very excited about it was the original inspiration for the show so that makes a lot of sense (laughs) makes a lot of sense from full circle full circle oh yeah i i don't know if you know this but i'm pretty sure my first moon knight comic was when i was 10 years old Mm. i you can't see it from here because it's my bottom shelf or my comic books right but i think in order, the most comics I have, like, I have more Captain America than anybody else, then Hellboy, then Spider-Man, then Moon Knight. I have a good chunk of Moon Knight comics. I've nice. always loved the character. No one else has ever cared about the character, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, which, you know, is kind of a theme for me. I have a Captain America hat that I had to have sewn on because when I wanted that hat, no one knew who Captain America was. <laughs> Yeah. So you sewed a no, you didn't sew the hat on your head. No, I sewed like, the patch on too. You sewed the yeah. patch on it. Okay, just making sure. All yeah. right. Just making sure. Yeah. Which <laughs> hey, maybe we'll get something similar. I've been geeking out on Moon Knight forever, and I'm pretty excited for other people to at least know who he is. You know, I, I have my doubts yeah. and I have my hopes for this coming television series. Um, you know, it's not gonna be rated mature which I find interesting because my first Moon Knight comic was him ripping someone's spine out to use as a weapon. (laughs) Not sure how you do that if it's not mature, but we will see Disney. We will see. Yeah. Um, If you can't tell, I'm really excited to talk about this and could probably just ramble on about Moon Knight forever, which is why Mm -hmm. I have someone here to help me stay on point. (laughs) 
There you go. Uh, Pastor Will, we are talking about Brian Bennis Moon Knight comic. Um, could you break down what this comic was about? What's going on here? And I'm, just let them know what they need to know if they haven't read it. Yeah. So this um, – yeah, and I'll share a little bit. My my history with Moon Knight was I, I grew up on on X Men comics and Marvel comics in in the eighties, and uh, Moon Knight uh, got his own series, or they're trying to play around with his own series during that time. And I did have a friend. We would uh, talk about the X Men comics. We geek out over that, and he bought a couple Moon Knight um, comics. And, and I remember him trying to say like, this is a really cool character. And like, even last night was a full moon. And I went out on the dock on the, on the beach. And I looked up at the moon. I was wondering if this moon guy was going to talk to me and make me the hooper. I was like, Whoa, okay, <laughs> we're going really deep there, you know, but, um, you know, what eight, nine, 10 year olds do, uh, wish that the moon gods would, would call them to be uh, a spirit of vengeance. But the, um, um, so I, I've always liked the character too, but I never really collected the book as much as I, I liked it when he showed up in cameos or the West Coast Avengers, or he would he would be a, a guest star in, in some of the other books I would read. Um, but I really enjoy getting into this particular uh, graphic novel with uh, written by Bendis and art by Alex Maleev because um, it helped me go in a deeper dive to try to understand who this character is before the TV show uh, comes out um, today. I may have already watched the show by the time this is coming <laughs> out, but the um, yeah this this is a uh, in the height of. So Brian Michael Bendis, a famous Marvel author uh, who now is an, has an exclusive contract with DC, you know, writing a lot of stuff at DC. But before he hopped over, he was kind of Marvel's go-to guy for writing all the hot, um, you know, popular comics, and and he did this twelve-issue series with Alex Maleev about um, kind of. How do I want to explain what this story does? So, so Moon Knight, Mark Spector is doing a TV show about <laughs> his life. And so the irony is that we're reading this when there's a TV show literally coming out about his life. Oh, so yeah. I, I, there, that's, the, that's the meta uh, deep cut that we're doing. But he um, he's doing this um, TV show or movie about his life, and he's not sure how it's going. He's on the West Coast. He's in L.A., and he gets word that something's going down in L.A. There's a kingpin, not in New York, that we saw you know, with uh, Hawkeye or Daredevil. There's a kingpin of L.A., and he's trying to figure out who this person is. Something's going down. And and the Avengers are around him. The Avengers of the day, back in 2010-ish, um, you had Spider-Man on the team. You had Wolverine on the team, Captain America, um, Iron Man, all, all those folks, uh, Miss Marvel, they're all um, Captain Marvel, all on uh, this team. Well, he's talking to Spider-Man, uh, Captain America and Wolverine, they're, they're around him trying to coach him and what, what he should do about this kingpin and this, this uh, kind of almost like this drug deal that's going down. Well, you come to find out, as we know, in terms of battling mental illness and uh, multiple personality um, disorder, uh, which is I don't think is even a right term now these days. I think they're calling it um, disassoci disassociative um, identity disorder, I think is the now correct term they're using that. Yeah. Well, you come to find out. That identity not, disorder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That these Avengers aren't really with them. They're in his head. And, and, and so you're like, okay, what's real? What's not? Which is my hesitancy or nervousness about this TV show that they're going to do. They're going to see a lot of cool stuff. And I really hope at the end, they're not like, oh, it was just all in his head. And he's in, you know, um, uh, <laughs> a psych, psych ward at the end uh, and in padded walls. I'm like, oh, I don't think Disney's going to do that. They did a good job with WandaVision in terms of handling grief the right, right way. I'm, I'm pretty hopeful and optimistic they're going to handle mental illness with Moon Knight the right way. So Anyway, um, this is a good story in a sense that you go through like in his head. But back then, a decade ago, they're using words like, uh, is this guy crazy? Um, what's the matter with this guy? He's a nut job. So they're throwing around those kind of um, disparaging amount, amount uh, words towards him, remarks about him and his describing his character. But you really see him try to be a hero on the West Coast while still having a relationship with the Avengers and trying to find out who this kingpin is uh, of L.A. Yeah. And they don't play a lot on the religious aspect of the character in this. Uh, to me, th 
this particular one with Brian Bendis was a very different Moon Knight than what I'm yeah. used to seeing. Mm-hmm. But it helped me in a few ways. It helped me understand why a lot of people see him as Marvel's Batman. It helped me kind of get that because, you know, it, it really upplayed the, you know, rich philanthropist kind of guy. And the, he detective had a detective. Kind of figure. Yeah, mm-hmm. they had all of that kind of stuff. And I was like, OK, I see why some people think of him. Plus, you know, I am vengeance. I, I can see it. <laughs> He has a an ex uh, shield agent who's kind of is like his tech guy helping him out along the oh, way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you have some other cameo from other characters that we'll talk about here in a minute. But but really, at one point in this graphic novel, he um, does it does it says the complete. What is the official title to this story arc? Does it have an? I just says Moon Knight by Bendis and Malie. <laughs> I don't know what the official. Um, I, I thought that that was it, but let me the complete collection. It's got to have a story arc name. Well, anyway, he he finds out this drug bust. He goes to figure out that he 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 goes and uh, confiscates uh, the head of Ultron, the AI, the killer robot who wants to take over the world. And this came out before the Age of Ultron Avengers movie came out, and uh, they are. After this story arc, they actually had a Marvel event before the movie came out called the Age of Ultron that Bendis was pushing with this big crossover event with all the heroes and uh, the Avengers. So, you know, there's a little prep work for the movie coming out at some point. But, uh, he, yeah, he gets the head of Ultron and this kingpin of L.A. wants it because that's big power. What if they're, this A.I. is going to gonna take are over you, uh, the world? Are we going to spoil who the kingpin is at some point? Yes. Are we going to well. let him figure it out? Okay. Cause oh, yeah, man, I had I to do some deep digging. I was like, man, me too. Cool. I didn't know who this character Sorry. was. Sorry. I really didn't know who this yeah, character I didn't was. at first. And evidently I read him once deal. before and I was like, I don't know who this is. So I had to look into either. it. Sorry. I, look in I didn't mean to interrupt thing. you. I was just curious nope. if we were going to go nope. there. <laughs> yeah, we will. But there, you know, he, uh, so, um, then what I, oh man, this is, this is cool. So, um, he goes off, he steals the head of Ultron, brings it back. He has his people look into it. it really is. It's not in his head. It really is the, the, the head of Ultron. <laughs> and then he starts working out and he runs into these like kind of underground characters, um, almost like the Batman, where he goes this underground like strip club kind of with this villain or um, shady person called Snapdragon. And oh, then he runs. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'll say, can I just say, though, the, the way they did the art at the strip club, I yeah. personally found it amazing how they were showing that in a way that somehow it just didn't feel sexualized. Right. Like right. it was very just dark and this is not shady, good. shady underground. Yeah, like this is how I think where. Christians view all strip clubs. <laughs> like just <laughs> bad. Right. Yeah. Well, in this Snapdragon, who's like the right hand woman of uh, this kingpin of L.A., then you have he runs into Maya Lopez who we know is Echo in the Daredevil, uh, Hawkeye, um, now Disney Plus kind of um, uh, Wait, era. Wait, Echo's of, in that? In what? Echo's in Daredevil and all that? That's where she, okay. her, or, um, she didn't show up in the Hawkeye, in, he did, she didn't show up in the Daredevil TV series, but she did show up, her first appearance was in a Daredevil comic. Okay. okay, I know who I'm um, talking about. Now. Sorry, well, Echo, who shows up, and really they flush out in the Hawkeye Disney Plus TV show, originated in the Daredevil comic book um, way back when. Her first appearance, uh, I have it somewhere, is in Daredevil number nine in 1999. Um, uh, so Daredevil's blind; she is deaf, and so her senses uh, go around with her being able to read lips and read people, and and they. Um, we saw that really fleshed out in the in the Hawkeye series, um, but but she is she is also sent by the Avengers to investigate, and so the, he she he ends up Moon Knight teams up with Echo, and they're trying to hunt down. And there's this kind of tension. He really likes her. Uh, there's times when he's wearing his mask. She's like, "Take your mask off. I can't read your lips. I don't know what you're saying." And he finally yeah, takes those it are off. funny moments. Yeah, very funny moments. Um, but then like there's this whole villain team called the Night Shift that I had no idea about. And I, I feel like I know my Marvel comics pretty well. It's a deep cut. The, the night shift, this team around that 
the kingpin of LA would send out and this villain called TikTok before there was even the social media um, <laughs> avenue of TikTok. So I feel like that's kind of fun. Um, but then uh, this, these kind of voices in his head, these Avengers, and I think Bendis captures uh, Spidey's voice really well and yeah, Wolverine's head really well and, and Cap's voice. really. And what Bendis does well, he's always been like king of dialogue. All his books from the very beginning, he has a lot of talking heads. There's a lot of words on the pages, sometimes almost much too much. Uh, but I was reminded when reading the book, this book from Bendis, how much I enjoyed Bendis a decade ago and why I collected like all of his comics, because he is just masterful at capturing people's voices and characters in the dialogue between the characters team books. He just does a great job. There's not a lot of action Well, there's action, but like the, the dialogue between the characters is just amazing. And so here you have this dialogue going on within Moon Knight's head that I think will be played out in the TV show, but he's watch he's what is real? What is not? Who is he talking to? And eventually the Avengers do show up because they're like, get word that they has Ultron's head. And he turns to, he turns to Maya and is like, uh, you see them too, right? They're here. And she's like, yeah, yeah, they're here. He's like, okay, just, just checking. Um, but it's a pretty, I, I, I really enjoy the story arc. And I think Ben did the arts incredible. I did, I was able to meet the artist at a comic con not too long ago here in North Carolina. Cool. He was, he was super nice and signed some books and, and Bendis um, it reminded me again, this book, how much I enjoy reading his dialogue and character development. Oh yeah. Um, which I, I don't know. I don't know if you got this, but did it surprise you when you found out that Wolverine, Captain America, and Spider-Man weren't really there? No, I think I think I remember this series way back when. I don't know if I collected this comics on my own and got rid of it or is buried in a long box, but I do kind of remember and I know his personality enough to say, like, okay, he's having this conversation. I bet they're not real. I bet this is all in their head. I don't think they're there with them. I I was questioning it from the beginning. I wasn't sure because the voices were so well. Like I was like, that is Spider-Man. That doesn't sound yeah. like Moon Knight making up Spider-Man. Right. Because I I have never been under the impression that Moon Knight got to know these characters well enough to re mm -hmm. them in his head. That well, right. like, man, Moon Knight really's got the cap and Wolverine yeah. and Spidey down, it turns out. Well, he made a he he was a part of the West Coast Avengers team back in the eighties. Yeah. So he he does have a, a kind of a deep relationship with and Cap with made him an Avenger. Like yeah. I've been, mm -hmm. you know, knighted him an Avenger, I guess. I don't I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cap yeah. he cap trusts him. Cap cap trusts yeah. him. But man, this this West Coast Kingpin. He showed and he looked so cool when he showed up. I I, I could not remember who he was. I, I think I might have remembered him from a Thor comic forever ago, but I could not remember who he was. Uh do you wanna break down the character? Yeah. So he, he looks all right, he he <laughs> He's a guy in a trench coat wearing a monocle, and his name is Count uh, Nefaria. Yeah, is that how you say it? Yeah, Count Nefaria, so. and um, and he's a super villain from way back in Avengers number thirteen. Not like <laughs> been literally the thirteenth book of the Avengers way back when, uh, and and even defeated. Thor because he he's almost like a mashup between like Dr. Doom, Dr. Strange, um, kind of wizard who suits, shoots energy out of his eyeballs. Uh, and <laughs> he, I guess he's, I didn't know who he was. So I was like, why are people scared of him? But evidently he's, he's defeated a lot of Avengers. So he's, he's a big heavy hitter. He's a super villain. He's not a D list rogue or anything. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And um, yeah, we won't spoil how it ends. But that ends up being the main antagonist. You go mm -hmm. through this whole Moon Knight with voices in his head. They don't do the religious aspect. I don't think ever. Like, I don't really remember. I mean, he might mention Kanchu, but it's not really a part right. of the story in this. And, and part of what I found weird is I, I feel like there was a few places where the anger, vengeance, gory Moon Knight. We see him for like just a glimpse here and there where he's the old glory moon Knight, but it's not because of Conchu. It's because Wolverine is in his head. And I feel like right. a lot of times it's almost like Wolverine took the place of the God of vengeance. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't, I don't know how, how I felt about that, but I did enjoy some of those panels where you see moon Knight with his, you know, makeshift Wolverine claws going through someone's head and like going right. into these villains. And you're like, you know, in one hand, Moon Knight could have just done this normally. But on the other hand, 
it's always fun to have giant metal claws. <laughs> yeah, so he kind of takes on the personalities of, uh, you know, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and Cap. He even gets like a shield that looks like Cap's. He gets he creates web shooters uh, out of an- the other hand that doesn't have the claws on it for Wolverine. So he's a, he's embodying all the Avengers in himself, um, and it's almost like that you know kind of stereotypical devil on one shoulder, angel on the other. What voice you're going to listen to, kind of thing. So you have like Wolverine going do it do what you do kill him and then cap's like remember remember who you are and then spidey's there for kind of comic relief but also they're they're reacting as he would too so so part of this it does handle you know kind of mental illness the voices in your head who you're going to listen to what wolf are you going to feed um uh you're going to listen to the angel or the devil what what, where do what are you going to listen to uh and and guide your life what what's your team that support you and we can talk more about that a little bit later on but but yeah i think Bendis is so good with dialogue, having all those going around, I thought was was really well done. And and part of it, like Moon, Moon Knight's story is like, yeah, is he really, you know, uh, called by the moon god uh, to, to do vengeance and to make the world a better place? Or is it all in his head um, is always the kind of the ongoing tension uh, with his character and they'll play with in the in the show as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I liked how they did this. I. I really liked when the Avengers actually showed up the first time because it does happen more than once. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when Spider-Man's like, OK, but did you have to dress up as me? <laughs> what right. was that about? That was kind of weird, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Coco's yeah, someone who isn't dealing with mental health. And I guess Spider-Man didn't wasn't, you know, educated in the right terms and all that. But he's just like, right. hey, man, that was weird. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. 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 (laughs) Well, I mean, we have to, as you read this, does it hold up? I mean, think with the emphasis on mental health, mental illness, or especially over the last, you know, three, four, five years, this was written a decade ago and they're throwing around terms and like crazy. And uh, this guy's a nut job, you know, uh, a little loosely. And then you're kind of like, okay, are are we being insensitive towards, you know, I would never call someone crazy these days. I would say, Hey, what's, what's going on? We, we throw it around. Um, but we're a little bit more attuned to kind of the words which he's used to describe somebody who's wrestling with really oh, yeah. hard stuff. So and that might be an interesting study in of itself. Um, the people who write Night Comics have always tried to handle it well. But, you know, as time has gone by, how we talk about these things and address them has wildly changed. So it might be interesting if you took a book from each decade to see how are the writers handling mental illness of this iteration of Moon Knight. Might be yeah, really interesting to look at. And, and you can psychoanalyze like his first appearance was in Werewolf by Night, number 32 in 1975. And here you have uh, a moon knight battling a werewolf who gets his powers from a full moon. So you see that link. <laughs> but also, you know, the werewolf is just is it um, a real monster or is it just kind of a, a personification of someone who goes feral, who goes crazy, who goes, you know, wild, you know, out of control. And here you have a moon knight who they keep talking about is this guy in control is, is he going to spiral out of control he's is not is, in control the, i can tell yeah, you. <laughs> are, are the voices in his head going to take the best of him and he's going to go crazy and feral and, and become literally a monster that that tears through people so I, I do find it interesting this correlation between like his first appearance yeah, and that actually, werewolf by my night and the connection with the moon and his mental illness as well that holds up because he he gets like inhumanly savage in most of his comics um you know i I have a comic where at one point deadpool says no that guy's too crazy for me (laughs) so Mm -hmm. you know when deadpool's Mm -hmm. saying that that you know this guy is intense um (laughs) so uh before we move on to a little bit more of the the deeper kind of stuff i know we want to talk about and some of the little technical details um i did want to just just throw it out there zero to ten how are you rating this one pastor will Oh, you know, I for me, I I give it a, a the art and the flow and the is so readable and reading I, again. It just reminds me how much I love Bendis. I mean, he he over the stuff he's done at DC has been okay, um, but but I give I give this an eight, like I, I eight out of ten. Like for me, I really enjoy going back and reading this work and getting to know the characters and being reminded of what was going on the, in the Avengers and new Avengers at that time. And who, who was uh, kind of the, the hot comics and hot characters of the day and, and their dialogue. So I thought Ben has captured that really well. And, and the art's really gritty. It's not cartoony. It's really 
you know, hard lines and hard inks. And uh, Maliev is pretty fantastic. Oh, yeah. who, who was also on Daredevil for a while too. And, and yeah, yeah. I, the art definitely helped lift it up. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. For me, I don't know how to explain this one. Six and a half seems too low, but seven feels too high. I'm, I'm going to okay. do like a 6.8. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I, and this, this is just because I think I've just come to this bias. I think very much like the uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, where if you're over familiar with the original Spider-Man comics, you're like, this isn't Spider-Man. I feel like it was like that for me where I was like, this doesn't really feel like Moon Knight. But man, it was a great story. I love how they did it. I love the art. I enjoyed every second of it. So I don't want to I don't want to come off as I didn't like it. If we just had a different character there in the same story, in the same struggle and everything, I probably would have put it at an eight, too. Right. But because I'm coming to this with, hey, I wanted a Moon Knight comic. I don't know. It's just a little bit a little more difficult for me just because I have a lot of history with the character. Now, this character uh, has been rebooted a lot and they kind of he can't have an ongoing series on his own because they they go for a certain run and then cancel and then they reboot it with different um, care. I think the the comic industry know how to collect graphic novels and just do limited series more and more. Um, but but do you think over the course of the time that it did, if somebody says I want to take on Moon Knight because he has these different personalities and he has kind of a uh, a background that can be reconned and rebooted because you don't know what's real or not it's kind of easier how do, how do you feel about the constant reboots does this fit in line with him or or do you feel like this one's kind of an outlier but the other ones do a better job like you said with the the charlie houston and um david finch yeah i think the charlie houston david finch does a much better job um mm-hmm. primarily because a huge part of the character is about his religion and questioning whether or not that's part of the mental illness and right. I just didn't see that. in the, Plus, for me, Moon Knight involves a certain level of gore. If there isn't someone's spine getting ripped out or, you know, if you feel comfortable with a 14 year old watching it, I'm like, hmm, I'm I'm not sure if that's Moon Knight. <laughs> not because of the <laughs> language. Or anything, but he's just similar to a Deadpool. Like, you yeah, say, yeah, he's just yeah. so gory. And that's the only reason I think that's important, because I like gore, because that's part of his struggle. That That's part of what makes him continually get more and more scarred mentally is because this God supposedly is saying, causing him to do things like cut someone's face off, rip a spine out. And, you know, when you see these things and you've done these things, especially when you don't feel like you're in control, it just piles up and it piles up. And that's, it speaks to who the character is because he doesn't want to be that, Mm -hmm. but this God is making him like that. Right. And um, I don't know. So I, I think, I think some of the other ones definitely do a better job. Um, I liked, I like the, uh, why can't I remember this guy's name? Is it Houston? Yeah. Houston. Houston, Yeah. I I really like that one that we're, that we're both reading now. Um, I have a bunch that I don't know who wrote it because I got them forever ago and I just read them occasionally and (laughs) I'm bad at the names of authors and stuff, but yeah, I, I like, I just, I enjoy this character a lot and I primarily enjoy it because of that struggle with the vengeance God and, the PTSD piling on. And I think part of why Mm. it keeps getting rebooted to answer what you actually asked me. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I think it's, we like character progression. When we're watching a show, we watch Spider-Man. We like to watch him grow. We like to see him change. Mm -hmm. And part of the design for this character is he can't grow. He's stuck. Like that's part of the design. And that makes it really hard to have a continual story because, you know, eventually people get frustrated, you know, he can't change. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the point so in a sense, I think Moon Knight will always just have to keep being rebooted as long as he is the same character. Right. Right. Well, uh, do they get, uh, maybe we ask, we want to ask a question of, you know, do they get the mental health um, issues right in this book? How do they handle it? And we've talked a little bit about that, but in, is the reason that he keeps getting rebooted or redone is because we learn more about mental illness? Like, all right, five years have gone by. And let's let's do this character again, but handle this in a different way. Not just as a comic relief or someone who walks in the room and you get to throw a crazy joke at them. Or is it like, <laughs> oh, we're really going to like, this is someone who's really wrestling with something super deep and, and legit. And how do we handle that out and help um, tell that story in a way that that helps others um, deal with what they're what they're wrestling with in their own lives. Yeah, I definitely think that's a huge part of it is just we learn how to deal with these things better. 
So we, we want to address it better. <laughs> you know, I know that that's annoying. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and that's a huge part. And then I really do think a lot of the reboots just come down to, it's the same thing that I feel like the church faces the same problem. You know, this is systematic ecology. I can go there. Ha ha. Um, you can. Yes, you it's, can. you know, we, we want to tell people, and it's true that God can heal you. God is there for you. God is the comforter, all those things. But as we learn things, we want to be careful not to say that God will always heal you, right? Someone might have a mental disorder forever. Someone, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people are born with Down syndrome and it doesn't go away. Right. And then you struggle with this. We want the story of Christianity, of the church to be, there's character progression for everyone. Everyone can be saved. Everyone can get better. But sometimes... You have this thorn in the side, to quote Paul, that doesn't go away. And I think that's the problem with Moon Knight is we, we want a story where he can be saved happily ever after. Mm. But as long as we're being true to this mental health aspect, I don't know if we get that. You know, Joshua, if you look in the Bible, you'll never find the phrase, and they lived happily ever after. Now, in Revelation, <laughs> at the end, at the end of Revelation, we the kingdom comes down, and there's some golden roads, and, and we have some peace. But throughout the struggle of, like, humankind and the human condition and, and our understanding of God, there's, there's never a phrase, and they lived happily ever after. And so I think that progression, I think, is important that, that yeah— um, so much the stigma around mental illness and, and faith in the church is like, well, if you're not happy all the time, then you must not have faith. And it's like, nope, there are times when you can be, you don't have to be happy all the time and be a person of faith. Uh, there, there's grief, there's, there's struggle, there can be depression. Um, there's a different way you can define happy and joy on, on a previous episode. You guys talked about it and did a really good job, but I think, um, that stigma that, well, if you have faith, if you just have enough faith, you can be happy all the time. That's that's not the case. Uh, you can you can love Jesus and have a therapist, too. You can you can love Jesus and you can take medication, too. I'm diabetic, so uh, I have to take insulin. I can have faith, and but I'm still going to take my insulin um, at night and in the mornings. If somebody has uh, uh, mental illness and wrestling with depression, guess what? You can love Jesus and still take medication to help um, help help you out and navigate this world. Yeah. And, you know, it's honestly, it's a question we get from non-Christians a lot that I really relate to. Because, um, mm -hmm. you know, they say, well, you said that God healed you. Well, why can't he heal, you know, all the things? And I resonate with that question. Like, I just, I hate when people dismiss it. I hate, you know, mm -hmm. when I was, when I was really young, I got earache almost every week. It was just a constant. It was a terrible thing. And one time my dad told me to pray. I went to my room and I prayed God, take this away. God, take this away. And I just cried saying the same thing over and over. Never had an earache again the rest of my life. Hmm. But I also have ADHD. <laughs> you know, I've prayed to hmm. hey, God, uh, you just fix this up here. And that doesn't happen. <laughs> so it's like, well, right. well, God, why'd you pick this one? Why didn't you pick this one? <laughs> you, you know, like, I, I don't know. <laughs> Well, well, yeah, I, and I think, you know, uh, we're going to go down the road of like God's action in the world and why God chooses to act in some ways and not others. And whatever our place and our role as being agents and and, I, and that same way goes into like this top back to Moon Knight. He's called by this God to be this God's right hand person in the world to uh, to do vengeance and make the world a better place or whatever. Um, what are we? We're called. God uses us, our hands and feet in the world um, to be loving agents of grace, ambassadors for the Lord. It's like, where's our role? What does God work through us or other, that bigger, larger question for another episode. But I think those are all great, <laughs> great questions. And that's what's so cool about this book. It's just a Moon Knight book. It's just someone writing, you know, a comic book. But yet, like what we do with God Loves Geeks and Systematic Ecology is we look at it and it takes us down these roads to ask the bigger questions about, you know, well, yeah, what is the nature of God? What's the nature of us? And then how do we wrestle with things like mental illness and healings or no healings uh, in the world in which we live and navigate? Which, hey, let me let me pile on one then. <laughs> okay. Because uh, we were talking about, you know, don't have to be happy all the time. The Bible does say, you know, the, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But then we also see, you know, Jeremiah, who, you know, as someone who's aware of mental illness, health stuff at all, you read that. And it's really hard not to think he had depression when you read the stuff that he said. Oh, well, where, where was the strength? You know, where was the joy of the Lord? <laughs> 
Yeah, and I think there's a difference between joy and, and happiness. Joy is a is a deep inner um, security or trust that that there is something larger than myself, uh, that I'm a part of a larger story. Happiness is an emotion, um, uh, anger an emotion. But what is the the red thread that's going to carry you through uh, your life? And it's to kind of you can have the joy of the Lord and still be like super pissed that some, that, you know, there's a war going over in Ukraine. You can have the joy of the Lord and be secure in your faith and still be like, yep, I am really upset that my best friend is going through this or my favorite um, drummer or my favorite band passed away. And you're like, okay, I'm, I'm wrestling with those things and you can be, have the stages of grief um, and still have like a certain sense of joy, security that, that God is with you and going to carry you through it. I promise I'm done after this. No, these are we're great talking about we're talking about, you know, you can have this and be saved. You can have this and, you know, still whatever. Um, and, you know, we talked some about this and that we did a review of Surprise by Joy. Me and Joe did. So if you guys yeah. go back yeah. to an older episode, mm -hmm. check great. that out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we talk about you can be angry and still be saved. Right. Um, when it comes to some of the mental health stuff, I, I do wonder, you know, um, can. can and hey, maybe this is too far. Maybe we shouldn't go there. But can someone have Down syndrome and be saved? Can someone with disassociated? Why can't I remember how to say it? Disassociative yeah, identity disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can someone? I, I mean, what if part of them is someone who believes in God and you know sees this, but they have a voice in their head that doesn't believe in God? Well, what happens in that scenario? Yeah, and I'm of the mindset of that. Um, the someone being saved isn't reduced to someone's cognitive abilities uh that that is it, it is it goes beyond and deeper than those things so yeah if somebody um has um cognitive disabilities and can't make the same rational thoughts or read a systematic theology uh, book or read or understand Thomas Aquinas the same <laughs> way I do, then I'm not going to question their salvation that I I'm of the mindset that God's grace is grace. It is a gift. And, and yeah, there's responsibility that comes with that. There there's discipleship, there's conversion, there's growing in that faith that comes along with that. But I, I don't think um, our salvation is reduced to uh, our intellect or cognitive, um, um, you know, exercises that, that we make in, in our lives. Yeah. And this, this might sound like a cheesy church thing to say, but also, you know, like I was talking about like the moon nights, you could probably look every decade and see, we address mental health completely differently. The good news is God's understanding of mental health has been exactly the same this whole time. Yeah. He knows all of it. I don't know how he addresses it. I don't know how God handles it in the end. But I know he does. <laughs> and it's a topic to keep thinking about. And and uh, yeah, my recommendation later on, I have something for us to I'd, I'd love for people to listen to. And but I think, um, yeah, that when you read things like this or even when you're watching this Moon Knight show. Yeah. Wh where does faith <laughs> coincide or intersect with with this show? Yeah, it's going to be fun. There's going to be some cool costumes going to be awesome moments We're like, whoa, how cool is that? And there's going to be moments like, wow, he's really wrestling with things. And how does faith play a part of that? What what is the nature of God? Is it a vengeance God, moon God? Or is there a pantheon of, of gods who are just have us on puppet strings? Or are we do we believe in a different kind of God that that um, governs and oversees uh, a universe that 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 does have a moral arc to it that leads to to love and grace um and the final and the final end of all things well speaking of moral arc <laughs> it does bring me to my last my last question i promise mm -hmm. i um well first first i, I want to get your take so we talked we talked about the the moon knight by bendis uh we both started reading which i just finished today uh, the Charlie Houston's Moon Knight uh, art by David Finch. That arc is phenomenal. There's one page where Moon Knight is breaking his legs. He's falling down this stairway or whatever and during this battle. And the whole background of the page is this giant full moon, beautiful coloring. Sorry. Every now and then you have a page or a panel of a comic that's just so beautiful. You have to mention it. Yeah. That was one of those for me. Um, mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about, about what you've read so far in the, uh, the Charlie Houston Moon Knight? Yes, definitely grittier and uh, gorier, a lot of blood, a lot of teeth, a lot of broken bones. Um, 
But again, it's I, part of me with Moon Knight is like, how can you tell a different story? I still feel like he's wrestling with like his identity. There's a different religious. I mean, he's literally at the statue of this Moon Knight of, of this Moon God, and and he's begging, please make me a hero again, or do I want to be a hero? So he's wrestling with his identity, and it's, it's very violent. So I, I like it. But Charlie Houston is a is a crime novelist and uh, knows how to write detective stories. And I'm not finished with the art, but but the panels and the art and the sequence. Yeah, David Finch came to um, uh, North Carolina Comic Con as well a few years back. And man, he would talk to you forever. He signed some books and he was like, hey, how's it going? And man, his his work is so good. Anything he does is is really great. And I'm amazed at what he can put on a particular page and, and fill it out. Uh, but I liked it. I, li- I think it's good. Um, a little different than this one, you know, kind of like the movies we watch. He's like, how can we go darker and deeper and grittier every step of the way? Sometimes you want to just have fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. and not, I feel like the this one dark. was just fun. And this yeah. one was more of the, let's get into the story and the dark gritty stuff. Exactly. I, uh, this is a teaser for, for Will and everyone listening. The end of that, uh, I guess it's volume one. Mm-hmm. He has an interaction with uh, with Conchu, and they unveil a lot of stuff that if you look back through, you're like, oh, that was there this whole time. And some of what's been going on behind the scenes. And there's just this twist that I was like, whoa. And uh, okay. very honest, emotional ending there that you're I was very satisfied with. I loved it. And uh, I hope you do, too. You need to text me when you get to it. <laughs> Yeah. 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 You text me that panel you were talking about and you're like, oh man, this panel is, is cool. So I was able to go back and. Oh yeah, that's right. Back. I sent you the, I showed a guy yeah. at work that picture too. I was like, guys, this is, it was just, well, just a piece of art that I was like, I, I need people to see art. this and appreciate art. it with me. Um, mm-hmm. There was also that in the, in the Bendis one, there was one scene where everything was really dark and gritty. They did a great job of that, of the art looking really dark where uh, Moon Knight was not flying, but you know, doing his gliding thing. And he was Mm -hmm. just so white compared to everything else going on and beautiful. Um, Yeah. If you could do a good soaring through the sky with your cape flapping in the wind, then yeah, you're doing a good job. Yeah. Which as a side note, um, this Charlie Houston one reminds us why Moon Knight wears white, you know, whereas a Batman, the dark Knight wants fear, wants to surprise his enemies. Moon Knight wants to see them, see him coming. (laughs) <laughs> he exactly. is he leans into the fights the punches the bullets he's like i, I want the pain he yeah he's something um <laughs> so that being said this this one showed a lot more of Kachu empowering moon knight to be that the um avatar of Kachu embodying the god to enact vengeance um and it reminded me a lot of these older religions, you know, the Egyptian religions like this, uh, Greek religions, Roman religions. At one point, most of your world religions were a lot more violent. There's a lot more vengeance. Um, even, you know, in Judaism, you know, God had the Israelites go out to war all the time, though there was a little bit more tension there. Because in Deuteronomy, you do have God saying, um, vengeance is mine. Let me take the vengeance. But he also has the Israelites go out and do this war. Um, there's a book by Karen Armstrong called, um, I, I want to say The Great Transformation. Yeah, The Great Transformation by Karen Armstrong. She is a religion scholar, not a Christian, who just looked at all the world religions and noticed <coughs> around the time that Jesus, Confucius, the Buddha all come around, around the same kind of era, that you see a switch where, where a lot of the world religions that are popular are the violent ones. Then all of a sudden, Jesus, Buddha, Confucius comes around and People start, you know, choosing these more peaceful religions, these religions that are more, hey, let the vengeance just happen by destiny or let God take vengeance for you, that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> do you think there's a reason for this, Pastor? Was there a reason that the world kind of decided, yeah, we're, we're tired of uh, these vengeance gods. Let's go to this more peaceful stuff. Well, you know, I'll say over the last, um, you know, last two or three or four years, we, we do remember um, – there, there were January 6th, uh, Capitol Hill riot. There were people who were, you know, God vengeance. They were putting vengeance in Jesus's uh, mouth too, which, you know, I think is heresy. But the, um, I, I think it's always around. Um, I, I would, I would push back a little bit in terms of like, I don't think that God had a personality chain when it came 
to Jesus. I think you have the same God of the Old Testament as you do as the New. And I, and I do think there's all these kind of countercultural, um, um, you know, Yahweh is, is different than Pharaoh. And Yahweh is there is different than empire and uh, uh, and pushes back on that. That this God who, um, uh, yeah, I think Israelites keep going back and forth with like what is power, what is not, what is king. Our God is better than your God. Uh, all humans do that. We humans tend to transform God into our image rather than the other way around. Um, so so yeah, power, um, money. Uh, my God is better than your God. I'm going to conquer you has always been a part of the human story. So I think that's always going to be a part of the religious uh, story as well. But I, but I would say that there's this thread um, beginning with Genesis all the way through and kind of even, even the creation story in Genesis is different from other creation stories where humanity is born out of the defeat of the gods whose blood spilt on the ground and humans rose up out of that. Um, the creation story in Genesis speaks of God creating and it is good and calling humanity to be good stewards of creation that they were called to. So it's not like, all right, vengeance war, you losers. Uh, you're, you're just um, a piece of mold growing on a piece of bread kind of idea. I mean, yeah. So I'll push back a little bit of that. I think, yeah, we're, there's this tension of, of, we're violent creatures and we want to want God to be a part of that violence too. In our competitive nature, you know, it's not just the Duke Duke basketball is better than UNC basketball and vice versa. And my God is better than your God and can beat your God up. I, <laughs> I, I do think there's a different thread in scripture from Genesis running all the way to revelation. that shows a different kind of God that pushes against uh, vengeance and violence. Yeah. Um, to support your point, <laughs> I, I want to read part part of this in Psalm 74. It's a, uh, it's very close to, I want to say it's a Mesopotamian story um, where in their religion, their God angrily destroyed the Leviathans and the world was bored of violence. But in yep. Psalm 74 it says, um, God, my King is from ancient times performing saving acts on the earth. You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters with the water you crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. You opened up springs and streams. You divided up ever flowing rivers. The day is yours. Also the night you established the moon and the sun. Mm. And what's, uh, mm. what's, I didn't even know the moon was going to be in there till I started reading it. Look at there. Um, Look at that. <laughs> that was just pure coincidence. Good stuff. <laughs> um, but what's interesting is in this story, God creates the earth by being a saving God who, split open the Leviathan. Leviathans represent chaos to the Israel people. So whereas in one, God creates the earth through violence, destroying chaos and establishing a violent order. But the Hebrews were saying, no, 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 no. God saved us by killing the Leviathan. And that is how we have the earth. Two different. Yeah, it's, right. And it's and under, I mean, a, a friend of mine says on, on his podcast all the time that God refuses to be God without us and, and that God is deeply relational and that even within God's own nature of father, son and Holy Spirit it's a it's a dance uh, of of love, a relationship of love that's mutually giving to us and to creation to say, I want you to be a part of this with me, that we're intimately connected and entangled with a God who refuses to be God without us. And it's relational, not in a sense of lording it over or to uh, destroy or you're all awful and I, 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 all those things, you know, it, or out of violence. It's like, no, I, I want you to be a part of my own nature and be a part of this. And that's where that progression and growth and um, understanding of, of growing and who God's calling us to become is a part of that story. So, so yeah, character development, you know, um, <laughs> talking about Moon Knight and growing and progressing. And then, and then also, I think it's really important. What kind of community are you surrounding yourself in this story? He has, yeah, the Avengers are in his head, but they eventually really show up to support him. And he's moved by Cap saying, I trust you. And he's like, man, Cap, trust me. Um, so, so who are your friends? Who's your team? Who's your support system? As you wrestle through life, you don't have to do mental illness or depression or grief on your own you you have a team systematic ecology we're here for you out there if you need <laughs> extra help let us know message us that you're not doing us on there we don't want you to uh, feel like that you don't have a support system who's the team that you're going to be a part of uh to navigate this world with 
Oh, yeah. And then in the uh, Charlie Houston, I don't know if you're at this part yet, but it's, it's not really a spoiler. Um, there's one villain who is sort of his whole identity is I know what someone's going to do. I'm the planner kind of deal. And he is thrown off. And I keep thinking it's going to be because, you know, Moon Knight isn't a normal, you know, uh, a mentally stable person. But that's not what happens. He's thrown off because of Moon Knight's friends showing up when he was told he was a loner and he would be by himself. And he just had right. no idea that that was going to happen. And it was just kind of a, hey, who are you surrounding yourself with? I, I love I love that answer. Um, And yeah, like like the story I was writing about the Vithan and the Bible, the Bible does a lot of comparing things where like it'll be a story like in Genesis one that's very similar to another religion story. But in their version, God is saving. God is loving. God is merciful. And I think that mm -hmm. contrast has always meant to be there. Um, as far as right. as far as the other religions that started rising up that were more peaceful. Here's my best take. And Pastor Pastor will can correct me if I'm wrong. And that's why he's here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but he can't correct me if I'm wrong. I, I would guess. And this is a guess. This is just me spitballing here, guys. God was preparing the world for when Jesus came to be open to salvation. Now, I'm not saying these other religions are, are right or anything like that, but I think that's where you see the earth suddenly taking this turn because I think a lot of mercy and a lot of grace come from Jesus other than just salvation. Mm -hmm. Now, there is only one way to God. There's only one way to heaven. I'm just guessing that that might have something to do with the overall narrative for other parts of the world. I don't know. What do you think, Will? Yeah, and you know we're doing a series on C.S. Lewis um, and his Narnia books. He plays around with that a little bit. You know, uh, truth is truth, love is love, and how that expressed in, in other cultures, other religions, uh, it still comes from still comes from God. That 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 kind of dialogue is um, love is love, truth is truth, and and how we understand that um, it's good to have a relationship to be able to dialogue and, and talk about those things. But I think yeah, Jesus is nature. And there can be other religions and faiths that that can be similar because, yeah, a universal um, truth is truth. Love is love. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll counter that because I know some people might say this. And this is also just as valid a hypothesis because we don't know. It also could be that Satan saw fit or, you know, the forces of darkness saw fit to kind of try to mimic the true faith and trick people up. I don't think that's what's happening. But, you know, right. hey. There's all kinds of hypotheses why things happen. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> However, that's why we that's why we do these things and talk about it. Talk it out. Oh, sure. yeah. Yeah. But and, I, you know, we we have we've been trying not to do a verse every episode because it's not needed every episode. But this fits so well. I, I need to Romans 12, 17 through 19. We're talking about vengeance here. The Bible says never pay evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is a sign in the sight of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave the room, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So many things here that relate to what we were talking about today. Um, respect mm -hmm. what is right in the sight of all people. Guys, you might not be able to trust yourself at all times. And that's why you surround yourself by the right people, right? That's what we were talking about. Have peace with all people. Don't take your own revenge. Don't be Moon Knight. <laughs> If you can help it. Um, <laughs> well, if you are surround yourself with people to hold you accountable, yeah. like what happens here. And, and, Hang out and with that's really what I'm hoping for this uh, Disney plus I do. I mean, usually there's cameos by other characters and other things. So we'll see this guy's going to be wrestling with a lot, but, but there's other people around and I'm, I'm curious to see who they tie in, who's going to be a support system. Um, who's going to come in to help him if he, if he goes off base, um, or, or or go spirals out of control who's going to be there to, to help him out so yeah. I, i'm looking forward to see how they unfold this supposedly there's not going to be any tie-ins to any of the other big mcu stuff in this series i don't know if i believe them because they also told me there was going to be no andrew garfield in that last spider-man we saw how that mm. turned out yeah yeah <laughs> exactly all right well pastor will uh you got anything else for him are you ready to wrap up yeah let's let's wrap up Um, yeah. So recommendations, what are some things that you, you mentioned one of the books, what is a recommendation yeah. you'd like to, yeah, let me, let me, uh, re-recommend that <laughs> the great transformation by Karen Armstrong. Um, she talks about how the world changed at one point. She kind of explained that phenomenon from her perspective as someone who's not religious, just looking at the history of what changed. 
And she proposes that we're about to go through another great transformation where we see everything change around the world again. We'll see for the geeky side of things, because, you know, I can't just leave them with something that serious. I rediscovered a comic when in 2016, when I got my car accident, I was reading through a series that I was I was going. I don't do this a lot, but I was going to the comic book store, picking this one up every week because I liked it so much. And I never finished it because I forgot about it for very obvious, I think, excusable reasons. I don't Mm -hmm. think anyone's going to Marvel's not going to hold me accountable for this. They'll show mercy, I think. (laughs) But I I never got to finish it. It was Rocket Raccoon and Groot. Um, The part that I read was by Scotty Young. But uh, Mm -hmm. Nick Kosher comes in and finishes it. Uh, It looks like the last couple issues have to do with Marvel's Civil War 2 event. I don't know. Haven't read that. But I know at least the beginning a few issues. What I love about this is they're standalone stories. It, it, this would be a perfect summertime read. It is one of those. There's an episode where they're putting together a team to play galactic football, and it's just fun. It is just a really fun series of short stories with Rocket and Groot. Highly recommend it. Yeah, Rocket and Groot, we, we, we love that duo, right? And so they are capitalizing off of that after the 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 movies and uh, Scott Young is a fantastic art, very fun art. Uh, I don't, it's a style all on its own. Um, no one does Scott Young. It's great. Like Scott Young. So it's, it's fun. Uh, some of them, honestly, I feel like some of the art, especially in like the galactic football episode really had like a, like a, uh, which what's, what's it called? Uh, Calvin and Hobbes kind of vibe to it. Yeah. It's like yeah, these little yeah, one-off sure. fun little adventures. And I was like, hmm? <laughs> sorry, nice I can't book. recommend it enough. It's so much fun. Cool. Well, I'll recommend two things. One, um, Brian Michael Bendis wrote a book on how to create comic books called Words for Pictures. Huh. And he is the king of words and talking heads. Um, but he named the book uh, Words for Pictures. And it's kind of an outline of how he writes scripts and how he puts comics together, all the work that goes into it. I would, me, a, a friend, a buddy of mine uh, would love to create a comic book soon. And we've written scripts and done outlines and storyboarding and looked at getting uh, Kickstarters or uh, submitting submissions to other companies. And, you know, uh, we'll see how that all goes, but, but Brian, Michael, Bennis, if you want to yeah, if you, if you want to think, figure out or, or think through how comic books are actually made, that book's awesome. And then when it comes to mental hel- uh, illness, there's another podcast I really like called you have permission by Dan Koch. And uh, the episode for you have permission episode 142: a theology of mental illness. He talks with a guest to talk about the stigmas around mental illness and a, a healthy way to approach that with faith. And a lot of things I said here were kind of influenced by by that episode and, and what they're doing. Dan, uh, good dude. Love his um, love his uh, his posture when it comes to faith in the world is it a little bit more on the liberal progressive side, uh, deconstructive deconstructing side of things. But but I love how he handles the big questions and and gives people permission to feel what they're feeling and ask what they're asking. So episode 142, a theology of mental illness is a, is a great listen. And we'd love to know your thoughts on that um, out there in systematic ecology land. Let us know what you think. Oh yeah, for sure. And uh, if you guys want more updates on some of the stuff we talked about, really do recommend looking for the episode where we talk about uh, mental health and another episode with systematic ecology, some other superheroes get mentioned other than just moon Knight. Um, and then we have that surprise by joy. I think that's a good for that uh, conversation of when you don't always feel happy as a yeah. Christian. Yeah. And, you know, we have a website. Check us out on the systematicecology.org website. And then we're on social media as well. We have a great Priest to the Geeks uh, kind of group page that you can chime in and share a meme and laugh. But if there's also a question or something you're wrestling with, you can always shoot us a message or ask the group and, and feel supported um, there as well. I want to share with you the next episode is a, uh episode about Morbius. That movie that keeps getting pushed back every month. <laughs> Maybe it'll come out. I don't know if it'll come out, but he is known as a, a Superman, a super uh, Spider Man villain and part of his rogues gallery. And kind of like they do with Venom, he's Venom. He's getting his own spin off in terms of his own movie. Maybe is it as a Spider Man villain without Spider Man again? I don't know. But they're, on the next episode, they're going to talk about his history and who he is and what's going on in prep for the movie. So we hope that you can tune in for that. All right. Uh, all right. Here comes the sign off. You ready? 
All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. Uh, We love you guys. Uh, Keep doing what you do. Keep geeking out. And remember, share the faith, share the geek. This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.